Hey, Alec Miller here, founder of Rose and Rogues, and I have another Liquid Gen tutorial for you. It's Liquid Gen with no D. This tutorial is gonna be a little more advanced. We're gonna cover importing your own objects, exporting your mesh, as well as how to get a very particular and difficult look in Liquid Gen, which is still water or non-agitated water. Liquid Gen's kind of interesting because in most programs, getting just like a plain flat surface of water is very easy and getting the complex white water simulations and flow is very difficult. Liquid Gen is the opposite. It's very fast and easy to get a complex, interesting looking simulation going, but actually very difficult to get a very flat and perfectly smooth surface. So I'm gonna be covering that as well as collisions and a few really advanced settings. So if that sounds interesting to you, stick around. I'm gonna be starting in the same project file that I used in our beginner's guide. So download that and you'll be exactly where you need to be to start this next tutorial. So to start off, we're gonna be in your DCC of choice. For me, that is C4D. Don't worry, I'm gonna show you how to do this in Blender as well. And then maybe one day I will learn Unreal Engine and add that to the list. So I have a pretty simple animation here. I have a hand and I want it to raise a sword through a pool of water, through like a little lake. I just got done watching the absolute classic Excalibur from the 80s. It's a great film with some great visuals and amazing music. And I was inspired to kind of make this cool Lady of the Lake lifting a hand through the water. Now, of course, this is a robot hand. This is just the default arm in C4D. And this is just a free sword I found online and then kind of customized. This is gonna be our lake, and I've already made it sort of the right size. When I import this, it's gonna come through where I sort of, I want it to, more or less in the middle, and it's gonna make things a lot simpler later on. I highly recommend trying to keep consistent sizes from your simulation file to your 3D file. It'll make importing and exporting a lot easier. So I'm gonna select our um, hand and sword mesh, and I'm just gonna export that as an FBX. Um, I'm gonna make sure that I have selection only because I don't want the this piece coming out. And I'm also gonna wanna make sure I have all my animation tracks selected. After that, I hit OK and export. The process is pretty much identical in Blender. You're just going to select your mesh, again, file, export, and then same thing, FBX. You can also do Alembics, but right now, Liquid Gen seems to play a lot nicer with FBX than it does Alembic. I'm sure in the future that will change. The only big thing again is make sure your animation is checked and uh, you're pretty much good to go. Um, selected objects, if you have other objects in the scene you don't want to include. So after that, same thing, just hit export. So now that you've exported everything, let's jump into Liquid Gen. Now this is the project file that you have if you watched my previous um, tutorial and followed along, or if you just were following along and this is where you stopped, that would be a great place to start. Again, go to that video and download this from my Gumroad if you don't have it. So now that we're here, let's change a few things. First and foremost, let's quickly get our light a little brighter because I have it dark for when I was rendering. Um, next, we're gonna turn off our waves, we're gonna turn off our white water, and we're gonna turn off our shapes. So now we're getting a little bit more of a pond-like thing, but it's still very chaotic because it drops in pretty far. So we're gonna go to our emitter shape node, and then we're going to up the radius to 12, so it's the same more or less as our collider. And then we're gonna drop the height of it to like, I don't know, five. There we go. And we should probably lower our emitter too, so that way it isn't bouncing around as much. There we go. So now it's just sort of spawning in a bunch of liquid all flat. And you'll notice it's very agitated. So even though we leveled everything out, we turned off our, um, our waves behavior here, we're still getting this very agitated water. And that's because like I said, liquid gen is much better at making noisy water as it were than it is making still water. So what do you need to make this still? Well, it's been actually pretty challenging um, for a lot of people using liquid gen, but I think I have a decent enough way of doing this. So first things first, we're gonna go to our simulation node and you're gonna change your voxel size. This essentially is doing is how detailed your sim is slash how far apart your, your particles are gonna be allowed to be. So if I turn off our liquid mesh and I turn on our points, this will help us visualize this. 
if your points are coming through as like all white, go to your appearance tab or note, I should say, and then drop that albedo way down pretty dark. And then you can also point it towards a color to get it to show up a little bit easier. So you can see our grid here, right? You can kind of see the spacing of all these and where they're being placed. So I can drop this down from one to zero nine, let's say, and hit apply, and it should get denser. Um, and I can maybe demonstrate this by doing the opposite. If I turn this from uh, one to like five, there you have it. You'll notice these get way more separated, get farther and farther apart. So essentially each, each particle is spawning inside of a box, right? And how big that box is, is controlled by your voxel size. So by default, it's 0.1, but if I change it to 0.07, let's say, and it apply, you notice I might get an error up here. That's because I have the limitations too low. So what you want to do is then go back to your simulation tab, scroll down, and here you can adjust the number of voxels, the number of particles, and the number of triangles. And this is going to be limited by your system. So I have a pretty big graphics card. It's only taking up six gigs right now, almost seven gigs of VRAM. I can afford to up this a lot. So I'm going to make that to 80 for voxels. And for the number of particles, instead of five million particles, I'm going to go up to seven million particles. And triangles, I can probably leave at five million for now. And there we go, now it's working again. And now you can see this really densely packed liquid. So even though I have the liquid pretty thin, this is gonna be much better. So now if I switch our mesh back on, and I switch our particles back off. So you can see we've increased our VRAM to like 7.9 here, almost eight gigs. I could keep upping that, but for now, let's try this. Let's see if this works. So it's still pretty noisy though, right? We, we can still see a lot of this noise, even though we smoothed it out a little bit by adding more particles. Well, the other thing we can do, and really our main settings here are projection max iterations and our projection target divergence. You can sort of think of this as how accurate the solve is. So if I lower this way down, it will just kind of do a rough estimate and then stop. If I have it really high, it will keep working for longer. And the other key setting is projection target divergence. This is going to be how well it conserves the volume. So the shape of the water, how well that's being held together. And it's better to have this at a lower number. So if we turn this up, you can see it's still really noisy, but it's kind of more consistently noisy versus if I drop this way down, let's say to like one, and then I hit play, all of a sudden we're getting a much, much smoother surface. Now you'll notice it's still reacting in some interesting ways, but at least when it starts, we get rid of all that noise. So that's really the biggest secret to getting a smooth surface is those two settings. You want your max iterations as high as they can go and your projection target divergence low. Okay, so next is enforce particle distance. And what this is doing is kind of forcing them apart. Your particles, when they spawn in, it forces them to be separate. So we turn that off then it's not gonna be pushing them as much. So that helps, but we're still getting this reactionary, you know, it's kind of bouncing off the edges of our container. For that, you wanna look at compensate compression. And what this is doing is essentially pushing the particles apart, kind of similar to this other one, because it's trying to compensate for them being compressed together. So if you turn that down to let's say zero, well now they're no longer being pushed apart, and now they're no longer reacting, reacting as heavily to the walls there's still a bit of reaction there, but it's gonna get less and less as we go. One of the things to look at is it might still be dropping lightly. All right, and there we go. So by just simply changing those settings as well as lowering this a little bit, there was still a bit of drop coming in. So you can see we have a pretty perfectly smooth pool here. It probably won't stay smooth like this forever. Eventually some sort of disruption will happen, but you shouldn't need it to stay still forever because why would you be doing a simulation if you need it to be perfectly still for a super long time? So that being said, we want to disrupt this water and we're gonna disrupt it with our shape. So simply go to your collider node, pull out from there and grab import. Under import, file path, you're gonna find your FBX. There it is. You might need to adjust the height of it because I didn't have this you know, starting kind of perfectly in the right spot, but it should nonetheless work. Okay, so if I let that play, let's see how far this goes. Perfect. And this is where that test earlier, where I made sure everything was consistently the same size. 
That's what really helps here. That's what allows me to import this directly into the right spot. I highly recommend you do that. Um, you can move things around and it will still work, but the more you move your model around and change the size and the harder it's gonna to be to line it up when you export your mesh. And already, this is a pretty cool sim if I do say so myself. All right, we're getting a bit of chaos here. Water droplets are going flying and whatnot. Um, and there's a few ways to fix that. So if we go over to our simulation tab, you notice our flip ratio is super high. It's very, very high on the flip and very low on the pick. This more or less just means how smooth or how chaotic your liquid is. And the smoother, um, the higher the, the pick, the smoother it is, the higher the flip, the more like ocean chaotic like it is. We're gonna drop this down to like 25 for now. So if you notice, we can't see our model and that's a shame because it's a cool model. So if we go to our collider tab, I have it labeled as play objects, but it's just a collider. Um, you can hit show. And what that should do is now show our model, but it's just this white, you know, model. And I don't like that either. So you can go to appearance, drag that out. And then under appearance, you can turn up the metalness. And now it's sort of like this metal sword. You can also change the albedo color to whatever you want. And that lets me see it a little bit easier as well as kind of imagine what it's going to look like on this metal sword when I go to render it. So this is cool, but it's way, way, way too still, right? I want, I want this water trailing up the sword as the sword comes up, even though that's not the most realistic. And I want it like pulling off of it and dripping down in a much more interesting manner. So how we're going to do that is if we go to our collider here and we go to our velocity transfer, I can change this to like 200, let's say. And what that's going to do is as this is moving, it's imparting a lot more velocity to the particles it interacts with. And as you can see, they kind of billow out. So you notice the sword isn't really picking up any particles though. And part of the problem with that is this relative re resolution. Essentially, when you import a model into LiquidGen, as far as I can understand, it turns it into a voxel shape. So it's no longer like just geometry with a bunch of triangles. It sort of makes it into a, a voxelized shape made of a bunch of little cubes, more or less. And the higher you turn this, the higher, the more cubes it's using to make up your shape. So if I turn this to like, you know, 200, let's say again, now, it's gonna collide a lot better with the liquid. Now you'll notice it's still not really attracting the liquid I, the way I want it to. And that can be fixed very quickly by turning up the stickiness. Stickiness is exactly what it sounds. It's how much the liquid will stick to both each other and objects. So if I turn that up now, you can see we're getting this real nice sticky simulation. And you'll notice it's cutting off there at the top and that's because our collider is too short. So what we can do is simply make this a lot taller. It's height, we can double it to like 22 and then move it up. All right, that should be plenty high. The other thing we can do is in our collider shape um, for our container is drop that velocity transfer down to zero. So that way that's not imparting any velocity to our simulation. It shouldn't if it's not moving, but you know, it doesn't hurt to be extra sure. So there we go. Now we're getting this much cooler shape here, but that stickiness is probably too high to keep it the whole time. And this is where I want to talk about art direction a little bit, because that's one of my favorite parts of Jenga's software, but especially uh, LiquidGen and EmberGen, is how much art direction you can have. So what we can do is drop the stickiness down, but if you notice, then right away we don't get that really nice starting uh, bulge of it staying on top of the tip for a second or two. So what we're going to do is animate our stickiness. So we're going to start at something like 16 and then after a little while, drop it down to like one or two. All right, let's see how that plays out. All right, that probably drops off a little too soon. I'm going to drag that out a little bit. And the other thing is I think our, uh, we're applying too much force to it with this velocity transfer. So let's drop that down to like 150. Let's do this. Let's turn up the stickiness to 20, and then we'll drop that down a little bit to like, well, we'll try it at 150. Let's see if we still get, there we go. So we still get that nice little surface area at the top, but it's not pushing it too far and sending it flying everywhere. And then it falls down once the sword is lifted. So I've done a little bit more tweaking and here are my final settings. I'll post an image in the uh, Gumroad along with this file. But as you can see, we can get it really, really smooth 
by just getting dialing this in. Now, depending on your scene, you're probably going to need different settings than me, right? It's going to be a scene by scene sort of deal here. But needless to say, the biggest secrets are going to be that compensate compression, compensate decompression, your max iterations, and your target divergence. Um, play with turning on enforced particles, distance on or off, depending on your scene. You might get better results with that on. You might get better results with that off. You're just going to have to play around with a lot of this. But I think we're in a pretty good place, all in all, without any super glitchy things or anything crazy happening. Just really smooth water, um, which is sort of difficult to achieve in liquid gen. So that brings us to our final section here, which is exporting. Um, now, because we're not doing any white water, we don't need to export those. And I might do like a really quick video later on covering that and how to bring those into various programs. But for now, we're gonna export out our mesh. So one of the things you wanna do is go to your import model and then there's this little transform output on the import node. What you can do is link that to your export mesh. And what that's going to do is match up all the coordinates. So here you'll see that up is Z and right is X. And you don't have to worry about any of that because it's going to be taking the settings from your export from your FBX um, or Alembic and then assigning that to the output. From there, it's pretty simple. You just choose the location where you want it. You choose the name. You choose the file type. I would do ABC. Jenga effects Alembics have come a long way and they're a lot better now. You can choose your number of frames and then what's cool is you can actually just grab this and drag this to wherever you want to choose the first frame. So the last setting is export velocity. Um, you're gonna want this on if you're gonna add motion blur in engine. So what this is gonna do is add three vertex maps for each direction, X, Y, and Z, and then tell your render engine which way you're moving. So if you want to add motion blur in engine, that's how you're going to do it is by exporting the velocity as vertex maps. And from there, you just hit export and watch it go. I've already exported this. So we're going to jump into Cinema 4D and Blender to look at importing it. So here we are back in C4D with our same model here that we had before. And it couldn't be easier. You just go to file, you go to merge, you select wherever it is you outputted your ABC and you hit open. Make sure it's the right scale. So, you know, we're using a scale of meters here. So I set it to one meter, change all this stuff, but generally just it's a, it's a mesh. So just keep it the same animation, keep the same frame rate that you exported it at and just hit OK. And as you can see, we're going to have our mesh here in the perfect spot. It's going to be right where it needs to be. It's going to play back super smooth and we can add whatever we want to this. Um, like I said before, if you wanted to Make sure this had motion blur on it. You just go to render tags, redshift, motion blur, check it on, check on motion vector. So motion vector is what you're gonna need in any program. And then you're just gonna grab these and drop them in each section. And that's gonna give you your velocity. So I double click this, you can kind of see it's showing the different directions. And that's that. Um, for octane, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, just grab your octane object tag. You're gonna to go to motion blur and then under transform, you're gonna to go to vertex speed. And then you're just again, just gonna select those three vertex maps. And that will be your vertex speed. So that's gonna do the same thing, like I said. So that's how you do it in Octane and Redshift. Um, now let's jump over to Blender. Okay, here we are in Blender. Um, I made a sun in the camera just so we could be able to see this stuff. Um, you can see we have our little hand animation still, and we're just going to import our mesh. So let's go to import Alembic, choose our uh, Alembic file. Make sure always cache is checked. I've heard various results, but it seems to work better, um, especially if you're trying to do motion blur to have this. Don't have his sequences checked. It's just one file now. Um, validate meshes. Uh, if you're getting errors, you might want to do, and then scale one. We're going to import it. There it is. And we can move ahead to some action-y part of this thing here. And then what we can do is make sure we're in uh, cycles, go down and then check motion blur. And I crank this way up, by default it's not this high, but this will let you see the motion blur. And that's because we have under um, our object here, we have our vertex 
uh, modifiers and we have a velocities modifier. So make sure that these are all lining up. If, if you're not noticing it, some, somehow you've unchecked one of these things. But if all those are working, we notice we're not really seeing anything in our viewport, but if I hit F12, I believe we should see, I'm not crazy, yeah, some real nice motion blur. So that's how you get your motion blur in Blender to work. So I'm not a Blender expert, but at least it works and you guys can make it look good by adding textures and um, shaders and all that good stuff. So that's how you import it. Super easy if you've done your work up front, right? If you made sure that your your arm lined up and you're checking that, you made sure to check the size before bringing it in and then you linked the transform um, node output and input. Everything should just come through just fine. So there you have it. That's how you round trip from both C4D and Blender into LiquidGen, back out to LiquidGen, and also how you do a kind of complex effect. I hope this helps out with colliders and, you know, getting smooth um, looking liquid, which I've seen a lot of people struggling with. And all around, if you like this tutorial, hit like, ask questions in the comments below. As always, you'll be able to get the project file on my Gumroad. And um, I'll include all my settings there as well, just as a screenshot of them so you can see what I did to make it all work. And last but not least, um, hit subscribe. We're trying to work on a lot of cool stuff here. I'm spinning like 20 different plates and it's a lot for a really tiny studio like mine that's run out of my house. But every subscriber means the world to me and I really, really appreciate it. That's enough yapping. I'm Alec Miller, founder of Rolls and Rogues and I'll see you in the next one.